Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ilham. Um, on behalf of the gallery, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to our symposium, Modern Architecture in the City, and our first public program for 2018. Today's symposium is being held in conjunction with our exhibition, Rupa, uh, Gara, Rupa, Ubo, and Panyatan, which among other things, traces the emergence of Malaysian modern art, uh, looking at the development of the city, KL city in the 1960s. Uh, and when Simon Soon, uh, who is the co-curator of the exhibition, and I were talking about, um, about the public programs, we thought having a symposium uh, like this would just sort of widen the discussion um, and you know, looking at sort of bigger ideas about uh, the relationship between modern architecture and the city. And we wanted to extend that conversation to Southeast Asia. So we are particularly delighted to welcome our distinguished speakers uh, today uh, who have traveled from uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Bangkok, and Phnom Penh. Um, so we'd like to uh, welcome Tanavi Chot Pradit, uh, Roger Nelson, uh, Shirley Surya, and um, Chang Jiat Hui, um, and, uh, and I'm sure it'll be a very interesting um, program. Uh, and now I'd like to pass the mic to Simon Soon, who will be giving an introduction to the symposium. Thank you, Rahel. Um, so good morning. Um, we're extremely delighted to see so many of you here today, this morning. And thank you for spending your Saturday with us for this one day symposium on modern architecture and the city. Um, in spite of the fact that no refreshments provided and for those who are licensed architects, uh, there's no CPD to incentivize your participation. Uh, we're very heartened that there's you know, a crowd building up uh, for this symposium. So the symposium parallels our current exhibition, Gerat Rupa Ubo Penyataan, 1957-1973, to which I had the great pleasure to co-curate with Rahel Joseph. The title translates into English as movement, form, torch, statement. These are indicative of key qualities associated with a loosely constituted group of seven artists who in 1967 staged an exhibition at the lobby of a newly constructed AIA corporate building in downtown Kuala Lumpur and qualified themselves as modern. By professing a sense of seriousness, rigor, and high-mindedness, these qualities set them apart from the post-impressionist Nanyang artists and the equator um, art society social realists in Singapore, as well as the realist painters of the Angkatan Pelukis Semenat Malaysia and the Amateur Painting Society Wednesday Art Group in Kuala Lumpur. But the exhibition does more than installing them as pioneers, pioneering figures of prominence. Uh, it explores the consecration of, of modern art in the 1960s Malaysia through the infrastructures that emerge in tandem with Kuala Lumpur becoming the capital city of a newly independent nation state. Rather than speak of these individuals as individual geniuses or along the lines of simply the great artists within the annals of Malaysia art history, we hope to relate their importance alongside the systems that were put in place that contributed in large part to their canonicity. Part of what the exhibition sets out to do is also to locate this within the changing landscape of Kuala Lumpur, uh, which you see in a, 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 a section at the far corner of the gallery, and situate the modern city as a locus for the lived experience of modernity. In line with this, we thought that it is perhaps therefore timely to program, pro, to program a one-day mini symposium uh, that explore related topics in neighboring countries that might help us to acquire a comparative lens, which will inform and enrich our understanding of what you see around you today. Now, one of the bugbears I have with the study of modernism is that the prevailing idea in popular architectural discourse that modernism in Europe represents a rupture with the past, and is, that is the sole determined, uh, that is solely determined by its sort of like allegiance to progressive and universalist values. In the meantime, its Asian sort of counterpart is primarily concerned with recovering a sense of locality through a search for specific traditional leitmotif that then gets translated into something qualified as modern, which stands for a progressive universalist language form. As a number of us have come to learn from a recent close reading 
of Le Corbusier's seminal 1927 text, Two Word and Architecture, it is the Greco-Roman classical past, recognized time and again as the foundational value system of European civilization that Le Corbusier turned to in his desire to formulate a principle for the built environment, a modern built environment, and configures it as a genealogical sort of like foundation for the thing that he qualified as the modern. Equally so, the productive tension between a universalist aspiration as well as the invention of specific customary and civilizational lineages inform modernist architectural practices in different parts of the world. Therefore, I venture that it is perhaps more accurate to suggest that a reconfiguration of what um, Professor Chang Jia Wee termed as a genealogy is central to what we are hoping to think through today by bringing together a multidisciplinary panel of speakers. They come from the disciplines of art history, museology, and architecture history. The symposium is in part inspired by a project which Professor Chang Jia Wee, a founding member of the Southeast Asia Architecture Research Collaborative, um, together with colleagues Imran Tajuddin and Lee Ka Wee at the Architecture Department of the National University of Singapore. So for those of you interested, I really recommend that you follow their blog. If the opportunity arises, attend their Biennale Symposium. I've learned so much from the possibilities of studying the built environment from the last one organized in early 2017, right, which I had the pleasure of attending. I also, I'm also delighted to have um, Ajahn Tanawi Chopradit, lecturer at Silapakon University, and Lok Guru Roger Nelson, a postdoctoral fellow at Nanyang Technological University, two very long time colleagues who, whose commitment to the study of art and architecture of mainland Southeast Asia distinguished them as some of the most interesting emerging scholars in the field of art history in the region. They are also here to some support my admittedly personal agenda, which is to make a case that the study of architecture through the discipline of art history and visual culture produces challenging interdisciplinary premises, compelling critical questions, and meaningful interpretive lens that are politically and socially informed by contextual forces. Last but not least, we have M Plus Associate Curator Shirley Surya, who is not unfamiliar to some of you here. Last year, I had the pleasure of inviting her to Malaysia Design Archive, an education, research, and archiving platform on 20th century visual culture uh, here in KL uh, that I'm part of, to give a talk on how M Plus is developing the architecture and design collection. She's backed by popular demand and will speak extensively about M Plus collection policy and to help us think imaginatively on what kinds of knowledge about modern architecture that we can produce through museum practices. So this session, these sessions will be divided into two parts. This morning we will look at modern monument practices through the lens of what Pierre Nora calls sites of memories or lieu de memoir. Here Nora argues memory becomes a subject of study, especially when great changes take place in society. And this rupture leads to a self-conscious quest for, of memory. The milieu de memoir, or the settings in which memories is the lived daily experiences, have therefore been altered. One becomes especially aware of changes that had taken place, and one finds that memories evoke in certain places no longer correspond to the change reality. It is worth expanding upon Nora's premise to consider these modern monuments as not just sites of memories, but also as sites in which memories are being contested. Their meanings differ according to each generation and segments of society, and the meanings are also continuously deferred, as if to suggest that, the nation, build, that nation building, not always synonymous with the nation state, is always, when you get right down to it, an incomplete project. And we transition into the second half of our program after lunch break to rethink the modern city through the lens of two disciplinary approaches. These are broadly speaking architecture history as well as curatorial research exhibition making. In methodological terms, it is to bring into juxtaposition a production of genealogy as an approach 
as in we study of tropical architecture, but also that of the constellative in Shirley's attempt to qualify the modern or modernism across a set of Asian coordinates through collection and exhibition practice. It's a bit of a thought experiment to see if this juxtaposition between a depth slash surface dialectic could be a productive way to rethink the city as sites where meaning resides and can be coaxed into visibility. And to paraphrase, to paraphrase sort of like Michael Steinberg's on his study of Abi Warburg and Kulturwissenschaft or cultural science, let's see if modern architecture and its relationship to the city according to this model, can be interpreted as a beautiful symptom. I hope you will find today's proceedings engaging and stimulating. Do come up and meet our speakers after the day's proceedings. I'm sure they're eager to share more with you on their areas of expertise, as well as learn from you your passions, expertise, and areas of interest too. I too like to thank Ilham for giving me the opportunity to put together this mini symposium of which the visual art program at the University of Malaya where I teach art and architecture history of Southeast Asia is a supporter. Finally, I would also like to thank our speakers, all of them wonderful colleagues whom I've met over the course of my learning and travels across the region for taking time off from their busy schedule to come to KL and share their exciting research with us. So enjoy. Um, and so let's begin with our first speaker. I would like to introduce um, Tanawi Chopradit, who will be speaking on modern architecture and constitutionalism, the Boaradet Rebellion Crematorium, and the Safeguarding the Constitution Monument. Let me give you a bit of uh, info to Tanawi. So she's a lecturer in modern and contemporary art, history, Thai art history in the department of Art History at the Faculty of Archaeology at Silapakorn University in Bangkok. She's also a member of the Editorial Collective of Southeast of Now, Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art, a peer-reviewed journal dedicated to, to the study of contemporary and modern art in Southeast Asia. She received her PhD in Art History from Burbank, University of London, under a Royal Thai Government Scholarship. In, 19, in 2015 to 2016, Tanawi participated in a cross-regional research program, Ambitious Alignment, New Histories of Southeast Asian Art, developed by the Power Institute Foundation for Art and Cult Visual Culture at the University of Sydney, and funded by the Getty Foundation's Connecting Art Histories Initiative. Her areas of interest include modern and Thai contemporary art in relation to memory studies, war commemoration, and Thai politics. So may I invite Tanawi up onto the stage? Thank you. Um, thank you, Simon, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone. And thank you for coming. And thank you for being with us on Saturday morning. I just told Simon that it would be impossible to see a crowd like this in Thailand for a symposium on a Saturday morning. This is really impressive to me. Um, and I thank, also thank um, Rahel and people of the Ilham Gallery for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be joining the symposium. Um, for my paper, Modern Architecture and Constitutionalism, the Boer Dead Rebellion, Crematorium, and the Safeguarding the Constitution Monument. Um, I would begin with the um, brief introduction of the paper structure and the history of the Boer Dead Rebellion in Thailand. So the Bawaradet Rebellion in 1933 was the Thailand's first civil war, which occurred because of the clash between the old and the new elites, which were the royalists and the people's party. The clash came after the successful coup that brought an end to the absolute monarchy in Siam, which is now Thailand, in, 13, um, uh, sorry, in 1932, 
which was the reign of King Prashatipok or King Rama VII. The rebellion was followed by a proliferation of commemorative practices focusing on the commoners who sacrificed their lives for the country, the construction of the crematorium for the 17 soldiers and policemen of the government's troop, and the safeguarding the constitution monument was key elements in legitimizing the subsequent authority and unifying the citizen of the new revolutionary nation state. And in the aftermath of the incident, the search for an appropriate language of laws involved the making of a new meaning of what it was to be a good citizen and national sacrifice. This presentation discusses the People's Party's new architectural invention, the crematorium for the 17 soldiers and policemen at Sanam Luang and the safeguarding the constitution monument in Laksi. The simple architectural form and the flat roof suggest an abolition of the hierarchical form in architecture. They relate to the concept of equality as they deny the class ideology manifests to, through the multi-tier point roof and elaborate decoration found in traditional primitive architecture. The new inventions also represent a work of memory that attempt to shape and control the Thai people's perception of the Borodet rebellion. The beginning of the incident was when Pridi Phnom Yong, the, Ministry of, uh, the Minister of State, submitted a radical economic reform. The draft national economic plan, or known as the yellow cover dossier, to the National Assembly in March 1933. The plan proposed the nationalization of all land and the conversion of all ties to state employees. The yellow cover dossier ignited a conflict between the new government and royal members and aristocrats. King Prashatipok harshly criticized this rearrangement of state welfare. Subsequently, Pradi's plan divided the cabinet. The Prime Minister Payamano Pakoniti Tada dissolved the National Assembly and resorted to, to emergency decree. The Anti-Communist Act was declared and Pradi was exiled to France. He returned to Thailand after Payamano, um, sorry, Priyapahon the leader of the People's Party stage a coup, and the new government under Phahon declared that Pridi was innocent. The yellow dossier, uh, the yellow cover dossier conflict was the origin of the fear of communism in relation to republicanism among Thai elites. In October the same year, Prince Bawaradet, a German educated minor member of the royal family, led loyalist forces from the eastern region of the country, consisting of, of Nakhon Ratasima, Petchaburi, and Udon Thani, together with a cavalry unit and several artillery batteries to Bangkok. The rebels, calling themselves the National Rescue Council, camped in Don Mueang, Bangken, and Laksi. They sent a letter to the government demanding that they reign uh, that they resign and accusing them of defaming the king and allowing Pridi to come back to continue his communist plan. This was the first time that the charge of Blaise Majeste and communism were used as weapon to destroy a political op opponent, tactics that still use, uh, continue to be used to this day. The government refused to comply with their demands. The battle ended with the victory of the government force the government held a special court for the trial of the surviving rebels, where many of them were sentenced to Tarutau Island in the south. Although there was no concrete evidence that King Prashatipok had supported the rebellion, the People's Party suspect his involvement. The king also lacked trust in the government because his prestige and power had been greatly diminished by their actions. As such, the king left the country for England in January 1933, and eventually abdicated his rule in March the following year. So for the government troop, the veteran of the Barbaric War were rewarded with the safeguarding the Constitution Medal. It is a black, um, it's a copper square medal adorned with the image of Pan Ratatamanun, or a book of constitution.
and surrounded by the symbol of victory and race. The reverse show the image of Prasayam Tevatirat, um, which is an integration of the Buddha and a divine monarchical image that acts as a national guardian deity. The deity who was invented by King Mongkut in the 19th century appeared in a monarchical attire carrying a sword in his right hand, while his left hand is raised to chest level in the posture of execution. Despite this being a monarchical image, Prasiyam Tevatirat floats above the inscription suppressing the rebellion BE. Um, and the year, suggesting that he was an opposite side during the, the royalist uprising. Pan Ratachamanun, this image, is, was very important to the People's Party ideological um, ideology. Following the People's Party revolution, in 1932, the People's Party invited King Prashatipok to grant the first official Thai constitution at the ceremony. In this ceremony, the king performed a constitutional act by signing and granting a book of constitution. The image of the granting moment became iconic I, um, and were widely distributed by press media. They function as a means to establish the constitution in the public consciousness. The royal granting held at the Ananta Smakom throne hall. Whether it was the result of reconciliation, compromise, or tension between the old and the new power, had become an official discourse concerning the constitution of the new regime. However, shortly after this incident, the king and the People's Party turned against each other after the, the defeat of the Bawaradet Rebellion, the new meaning of the image Pan Ratatamanun was employed against the monarchy and became a powerful symbol of the constitutionalist regime. The image of Pan Ratatamanun became an object that was used to denigrate the monarchy and more importantly, into the supreme law of the nation. As it appeared on a medal and um, in the crematorium, which you will see later. Uh, excuse me, can I just call this? Because it looks very <laughs> difficult for me to see. Sorry. Whereas the survivor of the rebellion were rewarded with the medal, those who died in the battle received their honor through commemorative practices, such as the national crematorium and the place in the safeguarding the constitution monument. Here's the picture of the grand cremation on 18 February 1934, which was the first public funeral of the commoner on Sanam Luang. Sanam Luang, formerly known as Tung Pramen or Pramen Ground, is an open field which had functioned as the royal cremation ground since the reign of King Putayot Vajula Lok, the first king of the Jagri dynasty. The name was changed to Tung Sanam Luang in the reign of King Mongkut and subsequently became shortened to Sanam Luang. Regarding its geographical location, Sanam Luang is in the area known as Rastanakosin Island in the Pranakon district of Bangkok, a fortified city with several gates consisting of the Grand Palace, the Temple of the Emerald Buddha, Bangkok City Pillar Shrine, and Sanam Luang. Before the 1932 revolution, funerary practices for commoners were forbidden throughout the entire area of Ratanakosin Island. The body of any commoner who died within the area was thus transported out through the Ghost Gate or Pratu P for cremation outside the city wall. As an area of royal residency, the residential differentiation that operates in Ratanakosin Island reflects social relations and the Thai socio-cultural codes of practice based on class. The restricted area of Sanam Luang is thus a clear indication of social inequality since it maintains the Thai hierarchical order by preventing commoners from using the space. But the People's Party's taking over of Sanam Luang expressed the way in which the new institution of power were imposing their new meaning on this specific landscape, reclaiming and reshaping it to serve their new rule. Prime Minister 
ฝาหนพลพายุหะเสนา request to King ประชาธิปก for, for permission to use สนามหลวง for the grand cremation create the profile change to the identity of landscape and practices that related to it the request to utilize สนามหลวง which had been used as a site for the cremation of kings queens and high ranking royalties as well as other royal ceremonies demonstrate an attempt of the new regime to destroy the old one and turn this particular royal enclave into a new space for public use this act thus emphasizes the triumph of the people's party over the royalist forces on the very ground that once belonged to them And from this period on, สนามหลวง has been used on various occasions, both for royalty and common people. Besides serving as a site for royal cremation, it was used as a cremation ground for those who died in the 14 October incident in 1973, and has also been a home for homeless, prostitutes, a flea market, and most significantly, a site for political demonstration. And where politicians may give speeches before an election, the Fine Art Department designated s a n a m Luang as National Historical Site in 1977. However, the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration closed s a n a m Luang for, re- for renovation in 2011. And after reopening, the Bangkok Governor forbade any political activities. Especially demonstrations, in order to preserve the space exclusively for the royal ceremonies. The request to use the Nam Luang for the commoners' funeral intensify the conflict between the government and the palace. Jao p r a y a w a r a p o n g p i p a t the head of the Ministry of the Royal Household. Took the king's response to p r a y a p a h o n informing him that His Majesty has suggested more appropriate locations somewhere else. But the government insisted, and finally gained permission. The king told them to bear in mind that this was against his will. The rearrangement of Sanam Luang as a funeral ground for dead soldiers and policemen was a practical application of the People's Party's principle of equality. It erased the traditional social distinction of the dead, and therefore advocated the equal rights of all Thai citizens under the new constitutionalist regime. The cremation of commoners as political martyrs who spend their life defending the new political system on the same funeral ground as the monarchy signifies a repudiation, a repudiation of the hierarchical segregation of Thai society. Symbolically. Such an act constitutes a new status for Thai people at the equal of the royal elites. The Ministry of Defense appoint Luang Narimit l e k a g a n a fine art lecturer at a cadet school, to design the grand cremation in s a n a m Luang. The new aesthetic language, simplicity, and the presence of Pan r a t a t a m a n u n which was inside the pavilion, uh, the crematorium. Were essential elements in the crematorium, it, which emphasized the royalist stance of the architecture. The crematorium represented a modified form of p r a m e r u m a t or an ornate wooden structure for cremating deceased royalty. Although Luang n a r i m e t r i k a g a n designed the crematorium, he did not leave any writing concerning the ideas underlying the design of this construction. The only surviving document that describes both the physical appearance and the function of the crematorium is the correspondence between Prince n a r i t and his brother Prince t a m r o n g The two princes were two of the most influential intellectuals of their time. Prince n a r i t and Prince t a m r o n g had no influence on the art institutions of the constitutionalist regime. Nevertheless, they remained keen observers of the contemporary scene, and the two princes. Exchange views on art, history, culture, and contemporary matters, while correspondence covering the period from 1914 to 1943. The correspondence was eventually printed as 27 volumes entitled "San s o m d e t or the Prince Message," and has become an inv- invaluable source of information and knowledge on Thai art and culture. In the letter, in a letter dated 3 February. Um, 1934, Prince Narit described 
the construction and physical appearance of the crematorium complex in Sanam Luang. He stated that there were two modern buildings like Sala Charam Krung on the west and the north of the chamber. Sala Charam Krung was the royal theater that King Prashatipok ordered to be constructed as a memorable gift to Thai people um, in 1932. It was the only representation of modern architecture with flat roof and simple decoration which was built under Prashatipok's command. Such a choice um, indicated features that distinguish the crematorium from Pa Meruma, the flat roof and simple decoration. The main building or the chamber also had the same features. Prince Zamrong's letter expressed his wonder of what to call this new funerary architecture. The prince wrote that there were three types of funeral, uh, funerary buildings. First, main for the funerary pie with a pointed roof. Second, wrong term for the flat roof building that keeps the casket before a cremation. And third, param for the flat roof pavilion. Pra Merumat, in his opinion, was the main type. Prince Namrong recalled that he has one order to build Param, the flat roof structure for the cremation of Mom Chui, a minor royal member. The building, this one, which had the same feature as with the flat roof, um, supposed to be called Param. And Prince Narit agreed that this should be considered as Param, the type of funeral architecture with flat roof. The discussion on the iconography of the funeral, funeral architecture between the two princes reveals that this new architectural invention of the People's Party's government had some trace of Prashatipok's modern style royal theater. Thai elites, both of the new and the old regime, were motivated by the desire to be modern through westernization. Hence, the People's Party's modern architecture, identified it by simple uh, architectural form, stemmed from the monarchy's modernization project. The People's Party's modern crematorium for the 17 fallen heroes therefore benefited from royal initiations, both in terms of the traditional funeral pies and the modern architecture. The result was a combination of two types of royalist legacy, the traditional and the modern. The crematorium with its flat roofs and simple decoration became a prototype of the new regime's architecture as simplicity was promoted as a new aesthetic language. It served as a prototype of the People's Party architecture. The new aesthetic quality, although first appearing in the royal commanded Sala Sharam Grung, is opposed to the aesthetic of ornamental loaded with decoration as seen in traditional monarchy related architecture, particularly Prabhmerumat. Regardless, as Sala Sharam Grung was the only modern building built under the king's command, it cannot be strongly maintained that this style belonged to the royalties, since the monarchy's modernization in art and architecture was mainly an appropriation of Western classical art. It is worth noting that, however, that the basic idea of Western modernity has already been initiated by the monarchy in the 19th century. But since Prince Naris and Prince Damrong had no part in the design and construction of the crematorium, it is evident that the establishment of the new hegemonic aesthetic notions related to the dominant ideology of the society, which in this case had no interest in the royal aesthetic language. The flat roof and simple decoration in the crematorium of 1934 34, are perceived as an abolition of the hierarchical form in architecture. The simplicity in this funerary architecture thus related to the concept of equality as it denied the class ideology manifested through the multi-tier multi pointed roof and elaborate decorations. 
whereas the crematorium emerged from the war between the old and the new authorities, it was essential to create a new aesthetic sensibility that was opposed to the old and established a new set of standards for art and architectural practices. The modern architecture in the People's Party context therefore takes an anti-royalist stance, and this gave form to the new humanitarian concept of equality and, um, and citizen under constitutionalism. The simplicity found in the People's Party architecture was appropriated from European modern architecture, which had became, uh, become the modern international trend during the 30s. The modern architecture may be roughly characterized by the abandonment of traditional architectural forms, the glorification of humanitarianism, rationalism and ideas of modernization and progress, as well as the use of modern materials such as iron, concrete, and glass. Nevertheless, Luang Narumit Rekhagan did not graduate from any European institution. He learned about architecture from foreign textbooks. The knowledge of European modern architecture permitting Thai academia and the creation of simplicity in architectural form does occur within such an atmosphere. Following the crematorium, a member of modern architectural sites were built by several European educated architects, such as Mom Zhao Ititep San Gridagon and Miu Ojitse Napai Wong from Ecole de Belsa in Paris, and Prasa Rodratanimman and Nad Poti Prasad from Liverpool University in the UK. These architects produced modern buildings with an international style appearance. Examples of these geometric buildings include the Ministry of Justice building complex, which the government built near the Grand Palace to commemorate Thailand's regaining absolute jurisdiction. The Grand Postal building in Bang Rak, Sala Chalem Thai, the National Theatre and Cinema on Rajadamnen Avenue and the commercial building on Rajadamnen Avenue. The erection of these modern buildings, particularly in the Ratanagos in Ireland, reflects the People's Party effort in transforming the city based on ideological grounds. However, in the present day, many of these modern buildings have been either destroyed or converted. The Grand Postal Building survived, but um, was renovated as Thailand Creative and Design Center. But the other two buildings are no longer present. Sala Chalem Thai was demolished in 1989 in order to open up the view from the avenue, from Ratchadamnen Avenue towards Ratchanatta Temple and the Metal Castle. The royalist thinker Mom Ratchawong Kukrit Pramod support and legitimized the government's plan to tear down Sala Chalem Thai. His article in the newspaper Siam Rat, published on, uh, uh, published on 17 August 1989 stated that the revolutionaries had bad taste and no love for Thai culture and art. That he further encouraged the government to purge the entire environment of Latanakos in Ireland of all buildings that seemed to be not beautiful and unfitting. Eventually, the Supreme Court building The Supreme Court building in the Ministry of Justice complex, which had been threatened with demolition for several years, was finally demolished in 2013. It will be replaced by a new building with the more traditional element of the multi-tier gable roof. The plan for the new Supreme Court, um, the plan for the new Supreme Court building is part of the celebration of the auspicious occasion of the King's 80th birthday anniversary on 5th December 27. Consequently, the ideology of the city changed according to the chips in power with the end of the People's Party seeing the return of the royalist order to Bangkok landscape. The most recent example is the royal crematorium of King Pumipon on Sanam Luang. So after the cremation of the 17 soldiers and policemen, the relics were preserved 
in the safeguarding the constitution monument. In the uh, on the inscription plaque on the wall of the safeguarding the constitutional monument, bears a poem, Saya Manusti, which was written by King Wachirawut for the Siamese expeditionary force, the volunteer soldiers that he had sent to aid the Allies during the World War I in Europe in 1918. The main idea of the poem is the importance of unity or Kwam Samaki in Thai, a value that King Wachira would promote it during his reign as part of the formation of Thai nationalism. The presence of Siya Manusti poem on this monument reminds the onlooker of the unity of the country's citizenry in fighting enemies. But who was the enemies in this context? A monument is an intermediary agent between the past and the present, but what past or what aspect of the past is this monument evoking? In Thailand, while commemoration which considers the, commoner, uh, the common soldier as a fallen hero is, relative, is relatively new when compared to Europe and America, where war memorials and monuments are the most widespread mode of public monuments and cemeteries. There is no historical evidence that indicates the presence of mass commemoration of the common soldiers in monumental form in Thailand before the veteran monument of World War I in 1919. The erection of the veteran monument of World War I for the fallen of the Siamese expeditionary force likely followed the tradition of war memorial. Um, for the individual common soldiers found in Europe, since King Wachira would graduate from England and still follow many European traditions. By the time of the People's Parties, uh, the European idea of entombing unknown soldiers was adapted to local funerary practice. Since ties are not buried but cremated, the ash of the 17 soldiers and policemen were placed in the monument, which had a similar form to a traditional stupa, a, con a conical belt shape or square structure that enshrines uh, relics. Traditionally, memorials dedicated to those who died in the important events use religious architecture, such as stupa or temple. They typically also commemorate the leaders such as kings, prince, and high-ranking soldiers. Traditional memorials are bound by religious ceremonies, since they are not only a commemorative object, but also an object for the merit-making of the descendant for those who pass away. But the combination between traditional stupa and Western memorial is overly visible in the, um, in the safeguarding the Constitution monument. Similar to a traditional stupa, the structure of the safeguarding the constitution monument can be divided into three parts. A high base, a body serving as a relic chamber, and a canonical shape top. Sitting atop an hexagonal base of this 14 meter high monument is certainly a stupa, like a stupa like structure with a square relic chamber. There are also two rows of lotus leaf. There are two rows of lotus leaf decoration, the typical ornament of traditional religious artifacts on the upper part, with function at the base for the image of Pan Ratatamanun on the top of the monument. The combination between the traditional stupa and the image of Pan Ratatamanun, as manifested in the structure of the monument, provides a new visual representation of the date in relation to national sacrifice. It is a memorial of the dead in the constitutionalist regime. The appropriation of the traditional, uh, traditional war memorial or stupa creates a new aesthetic form for modern war commemorations. It alters the mode of representation by transforming a religious artifact from offering support to older institutions to providing support for the new government and giving new life to existing cultural forms. Aesthetic representation appears to be fertile ground for political expressions 
as it is rep responsive to changing political circumstances, in the case of the safeguarding the Constitution monument, Buddhist iconography enhances the religious aspect of the commemorative uh, of the commemorative practices. However, the safeguarding the Constitution monument did not intend for everything about the borrowed dead war to be remembered and preserved. Instead, the monument is evocative of the politics of memory and commemoration in that it expresses the very mounting of the will to, rem will to remember by only remembering what it needs to. Despite the authenticity, authenticity of the real location of the event and the remains of those who had fallen, the monument acts as an agent of, of forgetting because it conceals some aspect of the very event it commemorates, the presence of the poem Siam Manusti on the wall of the relic chamber suggests the problem of representing the engagement of the monarchy in the conflict. Providing a place for the royal legacy in the monument thus has been interpreted as the People's Party's declaration of loyalty to the monarch or as a means to legitimize the suppression of the rebellion asserting that they cohere with the king's desire for national unity. However, these interpretations are not particularly convincing, taking into consideration the unveiling speech and the many different names in the monument histories. Consequently, the safeguarding the Constitution monument instead represents the difficulties in conceptualizing the Boer Dead War memory especially since at the core of the event, there is a royalist uprising. Instead of commemorating the defeat of the royalist rebellion, the narrative employed in this monument try to make people forget the bitter and undesirable past by altering the course of the event from an ideological conflict between royalism and constitutionalism to a national division dewiring from the lack of unity or that kwam samaki. In this process of remembering to forget, the pre-existing discourse and legacy of the absolutist regime were assimilated into the articulation of the world at war memory in order to construct a discourse of unity within the nation through the obscuring of certain facts. Whereas the grand cremation at Sanam Luang was an overt challenge to the monarch, the unveiling ceremony of this monument two years later demonstrated the government's reluctance to celebrate their victory. The unveiling speech of the, of the Minister of Defense, Luang Pibun Songkram, stated that this monument commemorated the depressing events in which the Thai people had been divided and killed each other. It was the incident that he, had, that he hated most and he, quote, truly had no pleasure to see it. The regent and president of the ceremony, Prince Atit Thip Abha, also replied that the monument evokes an unfavorable event and he would like the Thai people to take this commemorative occasion to learn from the past. He asserted that the monument was a reminder of all ties to remain united for the prosperity of the country. These two speeches responded to the poem Siam Manusti as they stressed the importance of the national unity. These speeches represent the safeguarding the, uh, present the safeguarding the constitutional monument as an object of remembrance of the horror of war, not of the glory of the victory. And for the goal of the national unity, the memory of national division is threatening. Yet what had been caused such national division remained unstated. The word rebellion not being mentioned anywhere in the speech. The ideological conflict that had caused the fighting was, exclude, was excluded from the speeches because the events were simply described as the national division. The fact that the conflict was among people within the nation, not an outside enemy like what appeared in the poem Siam Manusti, and that it was led by the, royal of the, roy uh, the member of the royal family, made the memory of the Boradet rebellion hard to accept, although it was still necessary that it be commemorated. 
So to heal this national wound, the political war was simplified to a national division caused by conflicting views, ignoring that it was chiefly about the ruling system of the country. The government further complicated the idea of national division by adopting the story of the Spanish Civil War, the war between the communists and the military, in a souvenir book published on the unveiling occasion. The government imaginatively took the Spanish Civil War as an example of internal conflict occurring due to the national division and try to place this interpretation onto the cause of the Boradet Rebellion, ignoring the real cause of competition between the new and, old insti uh, and the old institutions. The ceremony books reveals that, other than articulating, articulating the difficult war memory, the government took this monument as a means to counter any accusations of communism. The poem Siya Manusti, that start with the love for the king with, and loyalty to the king. And the absence of the word rebellion in the unveiling speeches and different names of the monuments and the story of the Spanish Civil War as an example of the national division, all of these indicate a general act of denial. The fact that this crisis being memorialized occur from an internal affair and the enemy, and the enemy came not from outside, but from within the nation were, were unpleasant facts that needed to be concealed. The Sufani book functions as a declaration that the People's Party was not communist, as the rebels has accused it of being. The foreword of the Sufani book states that the Thai should learn about the Spanish Civil War as an example of the result of national division of that Kwam Samaki. Moreover, it claimed that it was the duty of all Thai to safeguard the country from the evils of communism. Since communism had ruined every country it entered, while the front cover of the souvenir book presents a drawing of the safeguarding the constitution monument, the back cover displays a picture of an event which had no relation to the monument. Specifically, it shows the image of the corpse of the nuns that were unearthed by the communists in Spain. The header declared Spain lost. Oh, sorry. The header declares Spain lost and the description under the picture said that these pictures demonstrate the evil of communism who had dug up the nun. Who had dug up the nun's corpse in order to defame and destroy religion. The messages in the two white text box confirms that Buddhism and the military protect the peace of the country and that if the Thais do not wish to be like Spain, they should not speak but work. Be Samaki or, unite, or be united and discipline. The illustration of the book further highlights the cruelty of communism, particularly towards religion, showing the ruins of the burnt church and attack on statue of Christ, while in contrast, the pictures of the military are positive emphasizing the role of the military as the rescuer and enemy of communism. Having Buddhist symbol embed the monument, reassure those with the anti-communist sentiment, the north wall of the monument contains an image of Thamajak, a Buddhist symbol of national peace. So the utilization of such Buddhist imageries together with the history of Sp Spanish Civil War, signify that the People's Party and constitutionalism are not in conflict with religion and thus vindicates their position as non-communists. In fact, 
From the Grand Cremation to the Monument, the monks perform several religious services in honor of the fallen. Therefore, Buddhist funerary practices and their participation in the commemoration of the fallen create a new right for democracy as they react responsively to the changing political circumstance, transforming from supporter of the old institutions such as the monarchy to supporters of the new ones. The image of Buddhist Tamajak on the wall emphasized that Buddhism was an ally to the People's Party. It served as dual, dual role in communicating with the public. First, it declared that the revolutionary was not communist, despite the royalist accusations. And second, it emphasized that the government had no intention of harming Buddhism, one of the pillars of Thai nationalism among nation and monarchy. Consequently, the safeguarding of the, con the, safeguarding the Constitution monument served as a double denial of the engagement of the monarchy in the national tragedy and of the People's Party as a communist group. While the erection of the, uh, of the safeguarding the Constitution monument demonstrates the state's act of constitu constituting historical fact, a version of narrative of a borrowed rebellion in the People's Party perspective, the opposite version of the narrative emerged after the government's collapse in 1947 following a coup. The change of the hegemonic power puts up an opposing vision of the past, and this in turn affected the monument. Louis Kiriwat, the former editor of Krung Thep Daily Mail newspapers and a prisoner of the Boer Dead Rebellion in Tarutau Island, wrote in his book, Seven Years of Democracy, that this monument stood as an insistence of hatred because it recalled the war within the nation. The dead men did not perform anything brave, and therefore, the monument was meaningless. The impact of the monument on Louis, who participated in the event but was on the defeated side, differs from that of the revolutionary, as it evoked his resentful memory. In this circumstance, memories become a gra the ground on which the political battle is fought. Louis' alteration of the monument's narrative and reconstruction of the new meaning to the historical past, a memory that contested the People's Party version. For the former Boradet rebellion prisoner, the monument was greatly offensive. His perception of the monument shows that the onlookers encounter with the monument does not always, always cohere with the intention of those who conceive it. These layers of memories have problematized the memorial intention of the monument, emphasizing the loose connection between memory and object. Yet, this affirmed the monument's performative efficacy and its status as a commemorative representation that failed to be what its founder hoped, but indeed has clearly developed a life of its own. Thank you.